So in this lecture, next lecture, uh, we will take a look at how the combinational and sequential elements, uh, the finite state machines, um, and even the memory that we have learned uh, so far in this course applies to an actual computer design, right? Um, so to start off with, we are going to take a look at the general structure of a computer. We essentially will have the processor or the central processing unit as your, your main block, right? That's your primary block. And that central processing unit actually consists of two components, two major parts. One is the control unit or the brains of the operation. And the other is the data path. Data path includes buses and registers and whatnot. We'll talk more about what goes into each of them in, in a minute. So you have got the processor or the central processing unit, which has two components inside it. One is the control unit and the other one is the data path unit. Now the data path unit is also called the execution unit. And the, 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 the parts of the computer that fall in this category are registers, a shifter, arithmetic logic unit, buses, all of these fall in the data path unit. Some of them are combinational, some of them are sequential elements. But the control unit, also called as the instruction unit, is the biggest finite state machine that you can think of. Because that is the brain or the nervous system. It's like the, the brains of the computer. That is what, that unit is what controls all other, uh, all other components in a computer by facilitating the states. I am adding right now. So I need to provide uh, information to the ALU, right? So all of those states of a computer, taking in input, give, providing an output, I am uh, doing some uh, arithmetic operation right now. I am moving the data from one register to the other register. All of that is facilitated by the control unit. And it does that by activating or deactivating certain control signals that go to the data uh, uh, that go to let me see that go to the data path unit so there is control signal so for example if i want to um, add in my alu i need to provide the alu with a certain operation code right maybe 001 by looking at 001 the alu knows that okay, the user wants me to add right now, right? So that's a control signal, which in this case is the operation code or op code, right? And there could be other control signals as well, but that's what comes from the control unit and goes to the data path unit. And in return, the ALU might finish the addition and then it might give out certain outputs that might be helpful for the control unit to know that the addition operation is completed. So those are the data inputs that go back to the control unit. So you have the control unit, data path unit, both combined make the central processing unit. Now, apart from these three blocks, well, uh, really one block, right? Processor, which is divided into two blocks. Apart from the central processing unit, you also have the memory system where all the memory is, right? RAM, ROM, every memory element in the computer goes in here, right? Now, they, you can further classify this memory system into a cache, into a RAM, into a, a, a slow hard disk. But for now, we are combining everything and putting that as a memory system. Now, how, does, how do I communicate with the memory system? Well, you give me an address and a read or write control signal that might actually come from the control unit. And I will tell you what data is present at that location, or you can use those data lines to write something to that location, right? So address, read or write control signal, and the data lines, right? So, or the data bus. So using those three, the processor can either write or read uh, to the memory system. So that's what, you know, that's your structure of the computer. Just 
Now let's go in and try to take a look at some basic building blocks. The first one is a register and this happens to be a part of part of data path. Now if you have a 32 bit register or a 64 bit register or an N bit register, you might want to write something into it. How do you write something into the register? Register is a placeholder for bits, right? So this is a placeholder for bits. In this case, N bits. So if you want to write something to the register, then the first thing that you need to do, or in this case, the control unit needs to do is to activate the load input, right? So control unit needs to first control unit needs to make this active, make this active. So first you activate the load input. And that's what makes the register ready to take in the data in bits. So the load input needs to be made active. Then we need to provide the data in bits, the n bits. By doing both of these, you will be able to write to the register. Now, when you are reading, things happen in the, you know, slightly different way. When you're reading, you have to first activate the control, uh, so activate the output enable. So output enable, uh, if you think back to our previous discussions, we use this output to either disconnect registers from a bus, or in this case, I'm trying to read the information. So I want that output to be enabled. So I'm going to, the control unit is going to activate the output enable input to the register, which is when the data is going to be ready and available on the n bit data out bus, which can be that that's how we read it, right. So writing to the register involves n bit data in bus, and the load input load is just one input zero or one. And the reading from the register involves data out bus, n bits long and the output enable input. And you know, these two guys are actually coming from the same control unit. So in fact, I can put a arrow here to this as well. So th the, the control unit controls whether the register is being written to or being read from. And where is the, the data in and data out coming from those are coming from the data bus that is the connection between the memory system and the processor so the control unit sends the control signals accordingly to the registers that are in the data path but the data that comes here is coming from the it could be coming from the memory and it could be going out to the memory or it could be going out to another register we will take a look at those uh, those possibilities in, in a few few minutes. Now, another type of register could be a shift register in which you are not uh, you are not doing any in and out business. You are essentially just shifting the contents of the register itself. So what we have is you start off with the first you know the 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 regular register which is you use the load input to uh, write some n bit information into the register or and you use the control unit uses the output enable input and the data out bus to read something out of it, right? So to read the contents and to write the contents. So let me just highlight this in here and highlight this in here and say this is for reading and this is for writing. But apart from that, you could also have shift controls. Now shift controls could be inside the register, you have certain bits. 
you might want to left shift bits or right shift bits or no shift bits, right? So if you have those three options, left shift, the contents, right shift the contents and no shift the contents, which are coming again from the control unit. Uh, if those are the options, left, right, no shift. How many bits do you think this is? Two is right. We need this to be at least two bits because I can say 0, 0, do left shift, 0, 1, do right shift, 1, 0, do no shift. But I at least need, this choice is arbitrary, but I need two bits to do that, right? Of course, this is just an example. There might be more functionality to this. There might be circular shift, circular left shift, circular right shift, new data coming in. So there, there could be more possibilities with this. We are just showing a, 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 a bare bones of a shift register, which has the capability of writing data into it, reading data out of it, and also be able to shift things inside itself. The next building block, which is part of the data path unit, is the arithmetic and logic unit. And for the computer, we do two, uh, two number operations at any given time. So if you want to add, say for example, A plus B plus C, you would add A plus B, and then you would add C to the result of the previous addition. And so we only need two input ports, one for say input A, the other for say input B. So what we have here is a N bit input A and N bit input B on which we might want to do certain arithmetic and logic operation. It might be a bitwise or, a bitwise and, a bitwise exclusive or, uh, a, a comparison between what is greater or what is less, right? A, a, a comparator, an addition, a multiplication. So any one of those operations falls under the category of ALU. Though that's your uh, workhorse, workhorse of your computer, right? And which operation do you want me to do? Well, the control unit needs to provide the appropriate operation code, right? So control unit, CU, control unit needs to provide, needs to provide a appropriate op code. So suppose you have a three bit op code line, right? There are, there are three bits, there are three lines here. So if there are three bits for op code, how many operations at the maximum can this ALU perform? Max operations. You have three bits for the opcode. What is the maximum number of operations this ALU can perform? So addition is one operation. Subtraction is one operation. Comparison is a one operation. Multiplication is a, another operation. So like that, how many different operations can this ALU perform if the number of bits in the opcode are three, right? We are showing only three lines. eight is absolutely right. Because you can have zero, zero, zero for addition, zero, zero, one for subtraction, zero, one, zero for multiplication and so on. So you will have eight maximum operations, which is not very useful, which means you in, 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 a, in a real computer, you don't have three bits for the opcode. In fact, you will have uh, way more than three bits, maybe eight bits for the opcode, right? Next, when you actually perform the ALU operation on inputs A and inputs B, then you will, res you will give the ALU will give out two results. One is 
the actual result, the n bit result of perhaps an addition operation. But along with that, it also gives you certain flag outputs. Those flags are essentially uh, cues to the control unit that maybe carry out occurred. Maybe there was an overflow, so you don't rely on the result. Or it could be that the result is zero, or it could be the result is negative, or it could be any one of those flags. We'll take a look at the list uh, in just a minute. But apart from the result, you could have certain flags being raised by the ALU that the U control unit monitors to respond to them. What are the buses? So another, another uh, thing that falls in the category of data path unit is the bus. A bus is essentially a shared collection of wires. So instead of drawing four wires, I'm simply going to draw one wire and mark four on top of it, right? So that is essentially used to um, uh, talk about one entity, right? So usually all those four wires that we are calling as a bus or, or a four bit bus have the same job. Right, they are, they are just four at a time, but they are functioning at, uh, to do the same thing. So instead of four bit, I, I just say that, right? So that's a collection of wires for exchanging data with some defined rules, and we'll come to those rules in just a minute. Uh, and you know, th this is nothing new to you guys. You have actually programmed buses in uh, VHDL using uh, standard logic vectors, right? S standard logic vector seven down to zero or six down to zero. You you guys have done, uh, you have d you have done, uh, you have dealt with buses uh, many times in your studios as well. So nothing new there. You could have different types of buses. You could have data lines. The data could be either read or written uh, from uh, between two uh, components. So for example, the processor and the memory, you can write to the memory and you can read from the memory. So it's a two way bus that we are using red color for. And this is say N bit bus, cap N bit bus. Next, we could have address lines that only need to point one way. Why only one way? Why are address lines only one way? Who understands address? Because you don't get anything back. Well, so we only communicate address with what? You only give address inputs to what? No, 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 no. Here, we only give address to the memory. Yes, we only talk about an address location with the memory, right? Where we store things. For a register, we access registers using their load or output enable inputs. We don't need a mem. We don't need a uh, address location for that. The control unit is going to make sure that it uses the load and output enable signals in a proper manner to, to be able to access each register. So we don't need address locations for registers. We only need address locations for things stored in the memory, right? Right there. We only need address to talk to the memory. So where, as you can see, the address line is pointing only to the right. Why is it pointing only to the right? Because the only entity in this that understands an address is the memory. So the processor can only talk to the memory using an address. So the address will be generated by the processor and it will be going to the memory. What can you do with that address? Well, you can write to it or you can read from it. Now, if you are writing to it, provide the data here and the appropriate control line and the memory system will be written at that particular address with that data. If you're trying to read it, you uh, give it a read con uh, control active and an address from which you want to read 
and then the data will come from the memory towards the processor in that case, being read from it. So the data line can be uh, bi-directional, two-way, but the address lines can only go for to, they, they can only go to the memory. That's why they are one way. All right, let's come back here. So only one way and depending on how your memory is arranged, those address lines might be too many or too low, right? So it, it doesn't have to be the same as the data lines. They are independent. So in this case, we have a M bit address line. So be, to be able to uh, talk about each location, we need M lines. Now at each location, you might have several bits that are stored at each location. Next, uh, so when you think about a memory, I, I want you guys to think about memory as a rectangular block, right? And at each block, you have address one, address two, address three, and so on, address n, right? So you give it an address and you will be able to access each row in this one, either for reading or for writing. But at each location, you may have several bits. So you, for example, I can make this into a four bit, right? So there are four bits stored at each address location. So right now, the M bits that I'm talking about, those correspond to those lines, right? So if you have M bit address, in that case, you will have two raised to M rows in that memory, right? So all of those will be two raised to M because you have M bits. So for example, if you have two bits here, you will have four, four uh, rows in the memory, zero, zero, maybe zero, one, one, zero, and one, one, right? That's how you will access each row. Now at each row, you may have multiple bits. Next, control lines, where are they coming from? Well, they are coming from the control unit and we know that it is going to be a mix of one way and two way lines. For example, uh, can you guys, uh, so, so far we have talked about, talked about a few control, um, control lines. Can you give me one example of uh, a control line that is going from the control unit to the data path unit? So, so far, we have talked about a few. So, can you tell me a control input that is going from control to data path? One example. Do you see over here, maybe? One example of a control line that is going from control unit to the data path unit. That could be load, right? Or it could be output enable. Or it could be op code, operation code. Shift controls, beautiful. Now, the other way, let's talk about the other way. These are all going from control to the uh, data path. So can you think about one example that is going the other way? The flags from the ALU actually go from the data path to the control unit. So that's one example of uh, why we need the control lines to be a mix of one and two way lines. Next, uh, there are certain rules when you talk about buses, right? Rule one is only one device can write to a bus at any given time. Makes sense. I don't want to uh, make multiple devices uh, write to a bus because that will uh, corrupt the data, right? Nobody will know what is written. So rule one is only one device gets to write to the bus at any given time. Rule two is 
there is no such requirement while reading. Multiple devices can read the bus at any given time. Rule 3 is there is usually a bus protocol that is followed strictly by all devices when sharing the bus. So for example, if three registers want to write something to the bus, who gets to go first? Is it going to be round robin? Is it going to be a priority based assignment? There needs to be some protocol that allows multiple registers to share the bus. So that's rule three, right? No constraints on reading the bus. Anybody can read at any time. But writing the bus is critical, which we that's the main reason we need the bus protocol. So let's talk about three registers here sharing a bus. We have register one, we have register two, we have register three. Each register, these are simple registers, these are not shift registers. Each register has a load input and an output enable input. These are coming from the control lines, hence they are color matched. Now, there, they are data lines, they, they are n bit data buses. So uh, let's see. The rule one says only one can write to only one uh, device can write to the bus. So if only one uh, device can write to the bus, we straight away know that only one output enable can be true at any given time. Only one of these can be active at any given time because output enable is the control input that we are using to read sorry to write the data to the bus now there is usually at this point there is usually some confusion about reading and writing so let me clarify that earlier when we said output enable we said it was reading right now we are saying output enable is being used to write what is the difference here is one of them incorrect well both are correct over here earlier when we were talking about output enable being used for reading we were trying to get things out of the register we were reading the register reading the register now we are using that to still read from register 2 but it is actually being written to the data bus so you can say reading from register is equivalent to in this particular case writing to the bus so you know there's a distinction that needs to be that needs to be clear here output enables are being used with respect to the register for reading but with respect to the outside world they could be used for writing to them right so only one output enable can be true at any given time so, so as to follow rule number one, only one register can write to the data. And for writing, which bus are we using? We are using this guy for writing. This or this or this. Only one of them active at any given time. Rule two says all of them can read at any given time. Reading has no problem. So, which means that many of these load inputs can be active at any given time and I am reading from the bus through this line or this line or this line so I can read from the bus using load and I can write to the bus using output enables and because there are three registers we have three separate output enables and we have three separate load signals they are all loads and output enables are coming from the control unit. Next, let us go here. And so everything that you see in red here is going to be n bit. 
let's see there's a question can we exploit the static hazards to make sure that all output enables are briefly inactive during switching so it turns out uh, so you're on the right track you have to make sure that only one of them is active and the way we do that is actually using the decoders uh, you remember we, we uh, if we use a 3 to 8 decoder for example the decoder chip itself will take the responsibility of having only one output enabled to be active right only one out uh, one output of that decoder can be active at any given time so that's what you we would use to only have one of them active uh, a, a decoder let's move on here um now, how do I transfer contents from one register to the other? So for example, if I wanted to transfer the contents from register one to register three, what would I need to do? So I'm, I need to move things from here to here. What do I need to do? And in what order do I need to do? The first thing that I would need to do is to read register one and then write that information on the data line, right? So because I want to read from the register and write to the bus, the data bus, I need to, uh, well, the control unit needs to make output enable one active first, right? That's step number one. As soon as that is done, the register one contents will now be available on the n bit data lines. Now, once that is done, we have written to the data line. And now, once that is stable, give it some time to that for that information to become stable. And after it becomes stable, you can activate load three, the load input to register three. And that will facilitate the reading of the data lines by register three. So read from register one, to the data lines and then write to the register three. That's how you would transfer contents of register one to register three. Note in this case, if we do that, the previous, the old contents of register three are lost. However, register one still has the old contents of register one. So register one doesn't lose anything. Register three, because we uh, wrote over things, register three had some old data that was lost, but now it has register one contents that are new. Questions about this, how to do register to register transfer. And hopefully you can take this and, you know, uh, expand it to what would happen if I need to do register one to register two or register two to register three, or if I wanted to swap register one, two and three contents, you can play all those games now. questions here so I hope you guys noticed so far we have been using the data lines the n bit data lines and we have been using the control lines some of them only two of them actually load and output enable for three three registers but we have not talked about the address lines yet because we didn't put memory in our discussion yet so they are there but we are not uh, discussing them for now they will come into the picture as soon as we start talking about memory. Next. Well, this is uh, the summary of what we discussed. Um, and ensure that nothing else is using the bus. Make sure that only one thing can write to it. Output enable register one to the bus. After the bus has stabilized, load register three from the bus, several registers might load. So the theory, all of that is simply what we just discussed right now, um, which relates back to rule one, two, and three, essentially. Uh, so I, I don't think we need to uh, talk about this again. This is going to be repetitive. Now let's come to the RAM. So we our address lines will need to be, uh, will need to come into our picture. 
because we have started talking about RAM. Where does where is RAM going to be located? The random access memory. Our random access memory is going to be located in the memory system, right? So if you think about the computer as CPU and memory, so far we were in the CPU world. Now we have moved on to the RAM world, so memory system world. So in order for you to access the RAM, either for reading or for writing, you need two additional registers, memory address register and memory buffer register, M-A-R and M-B-R. Now these two registers, they can be part of the random access memory. They can be inside the RAM itself. But because we need to talk about their functionality, we have sketched them outside of the RAM and we are going to discuss what role they play in terms of writing information to the memory RAM and reading information from the RAM. Memory address register is the register in which we provide the address to which we want to either write or read from, right? So whether if you want to talk to the RAM, you need to talk to it using an address. So if you want to give it an address, that address needs to be provided, that needs to be sent to the memory address register. Both for reading and writing, you need to use MAR, the address that you are trying to read from or write to. The address goes there. Now, once you provide the address over here in MAR, there is usually uh, the data that is being read or written to the RAM. The data itself goes in memory buffer register. Again, these two registers, MAR and MBR, play a role in both reading and writing. Because whenever you read and write, you need an address to read and write and you need the data to be, re uh, when, when you write, you need the data to, to write. And when you read, after you read, you have the data. So you, you, you have the, the role of those two buff, those two registers. Now, apart from those two registers, there are sev uh, a few control lines that are coming from the control unit to the RAM. One is uh, chip select input. If you have multiple RAM chips, then if you want to uh, select one chip specifically, for that you might have a control input. You, another uh, control input for either reading to uh, either reading from the RAM. So reading is one here and writing is zero here, right? Because write is an active low input. So you can only do one at a time, right? You can either write to a location or read from a location. So that control line also comes in. And if the processor is uh, performing operations at a much faster rate than the RAM can respond to, then the RAM can ask the processor to slow down. So slow RAMs usually ask the processor to wait using that wait, uh, wait control line that is going from the RAM to the, the processor, in this case, the control unit. So that's the RAM, um, uh, in in a you know in in a very high level view we will go deep into it um, as we move further now inside each of e this ram itself this is where you will have you know rows and then you, at each row you will have multiple uh, multiple bits being stored at each location but the address to those locations should be provided in mar and the data that is being written or being read from that location goes to the MBR, memory buffer register. So whenever you think about memory, think two things, address and data. Address goes in MAR, data goes in MBR. Now let's talk about uh, how do you start building a computer, right? So the basic idea to build a computer is that I will uh, store my instructions in the memory, the stored program computer concept. So this is an instruction controlled digital system with a memory. 
all the instructions are in the memory, all the results might uh, be stored back in the memory, but we will use the ALU to uh, actually do the work or execute uh, some operations and our control unit will be the mastermind to facilitate all that data movement. So a sequence of instructions are stored in the memory and we will go uh, read the memory uh, in a particular sequence, in a particular f fashion um, to, to know for, so that the computer knows what to do, right? So the instructions are stored in the memory here. That's idea number one. The set of instructions constitute the program. Usually they are written as one continuous block in the memory. Maybe say, for example, from here to here, right? I hope you can, you guys can uh, relate this to uh, your boot, right? The, the boot uh, in your computer is stored at a particular location. So whenever your computer starts, you will start executing uh, instructions starting at the first address of your boot program. And then it gets handed off to other things. All right, let's see. The same memory will also hold data needed to execute the program. So for example, if you add, want to add two numbers, where are those two numbers? In the memory. So the program is in the memory, the data is in the memory, and the same memory also holds the outputs. So for example, if you are done with the addition, you may want to store that result somewhere. You will put it back in the memory. And for all of this to work, we would have to assume that the memory is infinitely large because everything is going over there. The programs, the data, the outputs, everything is going there. So that's the, the that's uh, that's something that we are going to expand on. What are the sequence of steps? What all is involved in this uh, stored program computer concept? Now the other uh, idea is an instruction cycle. So an instruction cycle could be five steps and we'll talk about what these five steps are and the processor keeps executing these five steps one after the other. So step one is fetch the next instruction or the first instruction from the memory to a register. The register is usually called the instruction register, right? So for example, if you guys are a, com a, a computer and you're waiting for instructions, if somebody comes and says, do something, the first thing you would ask is, do what, right? So you would need to know what is the instruction? What do you want me to do? The, the, the computer is going to ask you, what do you want me to do? That's the first, first, a problem that we need to solve. Now, if I say that, yeah, you, you want to know uh, what, you, uh, what I want you to do, I have actually written it up on a piece of paper and I have put it in a particular location, right? I have put the instruction, I've written the instruction on a piece of paper and I have put that piece of paper somewhere. So go find it, right? That's your instruction register and the program counter. The program counter is a register that holds the address of the next instruction. So this is the, pro think of program counter as, uh, how do I know where the piece of paper is? And then treat the instruction register as the piece of paper itself on which you have the instruction written out. Right. So two things here for step one. One is I need to get the next instruction or the first instruction that needs to be executed. This might be addition. It might be something else, but I need the instruction. And if I need the instruction, I'm going to tell you the instruction using two things. One, I'm going to use a program counter to talk about the address of the next instruction not the next instruction, the address of the next instruction. A lot of students get confused between the instruction register and the program counter. The program counter holds an address. The instruction register 
holds an instruction. They are only related by the statement program counter holds the address of the next instruction to be executed and that next instruction will need to get loaded into the instruction register IR. So we'll use PC for this, we will use IR for this. But program counter holds an address, instruction register holds an instruction. That's a distinction I want you guys to make. But you know, if, if I decode the instruction register, I will actually understand what that instruction is. Addition, subtraction, what is it, right? So step number two is to decode the instruction that is present in the instruction register. Once I decode the instruction, it might be add, add what? Add two numbers. So I need to next in step three, fetch operands as needed. So for example, if I want to add two numbers and those numbers are in the memory, I've decoded the instruction as addition, but now to carry out the addition in step four, to execute the instruction, I also need the numbers to be added. And the numbers to be added are in the memory. So I need to fetch the operands. So step two, decode the instruction that is in the IR, instruction register. Step three is to fetch any operands needed. Sometimes we don't need to do the fetching. Step four is to execute the instruction. Who executes the instruction? Which component that we learn about today executes the instruction? ALU is perfect. Uh, actually, let's do this. Uh, who decodes the instruction? Who decodes the instruction? So the, the control unit actually decodes the instruction. So it looks at some part of the instruction register, usually the, 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 the most significant bits, there might be 10 of them, there might be eight of them, there might be three of them, but it, they are usually present in the most significant spots, uh, slots of the instruction register. Those are the operation code, that's the op code. So the control unit observes those uh, bits in the instruction register and then looking at that uh, bits sequence, it decodes the instruction as addition or whatever. And then appropriately sends out control signals to ALU to carry out such operation. Fetching any operands, who does that? Actually control unit facilitates that, right? To move data, we need load and output enable. So to fetch uh, any operands, uh, we would need memory uh, and control unit to facilitate that movement. But executing the instruction, ALU will do it. And then step five is to do internal housekeeping, which essentially means increment the program counter such that it now contains the address to the next instruction. So program counter holds an address. And if I write my program in a particular sequence, one after the other instruction, after I get done with one instruction, I simply increment program counter by one and I continue with this infinite loop. So as long as I don't get the halt instruction in the program, I will continue doing step one through five in an infinite loop forever. Get Every, and everything starts with the program counter. Program counter is the one that holds the address to the next instruction, which means in our analogy, it means program counter holds the location of the paper, the piece of paper that has the instruction written on it, right? So everything starts with that. Where? What is the location, right? So think about it like a treasure hunt, right? 
in, in a treasure hunt, first you need to know the location and then you can go to that location to understand the next piece of the puzzle. So the, the puzzle itself is the instruction register, but the location is in the program counter. The address is in the program counter. So everything has to start with the program counter. You look at the program counter, you will see an address. You go to that address in the RAM, load the contents at that address into the register instruction register. Then move on to step two, decode that instruction. Then move on to step three, based on the operation that needs to be provided, the that needs to be executed, you may need to get some operands from the memory. Get them. Keep them ready for the ALU to do the, uh, to do the execution. Step four, execute the instruction. Step five, increment program counter by one. And then lather, rinse and repeat, right? This, uh, this cycle keeps going on. Now let's try to put them together. What we have over here is MAR, your memory address register and MBR, memory buffer register. MAR goes to the memory address bus that is essentially going to provide the address to the memory system, right? So it is going, going to go from MAR to the memory system here. Actually memory is also over here as well. So I'm, I cannot draw it here. Memory data bus interacts with the memory buffer register because that is where the data is getting exchanged, either reading or writing. But inside this single bus design, we only have a single bus. So one bus for everything, for uh, interacting with program counter, for instruction register, for accumulator, for ALU, for, for everything there is just one bus. Which means that you know, there are going to be a lot of constraints. So my addresses need to be consistent with the the number of bits that I have, right? So which means if I go back in a single bus design, what is the constraint? The constraint is, if I go all the way back here, my N and M need to be the same, right? Because if a program counter holds an address and I'm using the same bus to, in, to talk about data, then for a single bus design, capital N and cap M need to be the same, which puts a lot of limitations on our uh, uh, program execution, which is why we will later move on to a three bus design, but that's coming up later. So in a single bus design, apart from having a memory address register and a memory buffer register that are used in uh, along with the memory system, one is for address, one is for the data to be exchanged. We have program counter, PC. What is PC? PC holds the address of next instruction. This is where everything starts. IR, the instruction register, holds the fetched instruction. You told me the address of the next instruction. I got hold of that instruction, right? So instruction register will hold the instruction that you want to execute. Next, you have the accumulator. Accumulator is a register that is involved in most instructions. And actually, it is hardwired to one of the inputs to the ALU. In ALU A side is actually hardwired to the accumulator. So for example, if you were adding three numbers, A plus B plus C, you could add A plus B, store the result in the accumulator, and then in the next instruction execution, you can just take the uh, input from the accumulator and add the number C to it. Right, so you can use accumulator, think of it as an intermediate register that you can use in a smart way to, uh, to reduce time, right? Otherwise, what would you have to do? You would have to add A and B, store the result in the memory, and then bring it back into the memory and then add C to it, right? So that, that takes a lot of time. Instead, you can use an accumulator to store temporary results. Now, the bus, the single bus over here, is the highway to transfer data from one point to the other. Uh, do you think I need to transfer the instruction? So, where do you think things begin? Program counter. I've been ke I've kept on saying that everything become starts with the program counter because fetching the instruction which is step number one, means I need to look at the address where the instruction is present. 
the address to the instruction is present in program counter. So what will I do? I will read program counter in, uh, the address in the program counter into the MAR. That's my first step. The contents of the program counter are read into the MAR. And then I will say, I will activate read to memory, right? I will, I will ask the memory to read information or contents at that particular address, MAR, right? What will I get? What I will get is in the MBR, I will receive the instruction, right? How is that? Program counter holds the address of the next instruction. I read that particular address and hence I got the instruction itself into the MBR. And once I get into the MBR, it eventually needs, this is an instruction, right? So it needs to go to where? It needs to go to IR. And once it goes to IR, the control unit is going to decode the instruction and then say, all right, this is this involves addition and it's going to carry out step three and step four. So that's how things are going to happen. From program counter to the MAR, you read memory, you will read an instruction into the MBR, MBR will go to IR, control unit will decode the instruction next, and if needed, fetch the, fetch the operands from the memory. And all of this is happening over here as a single bus design, which means I can only, you remember, you can only write to the bus. Only one uh, register can write to the bus at any given time. You can read from it at any time. Many people can read from it at any time, but writing can only happen one at a time, which means this single bus design is going to be extremely slow. I cannot do things that are uh, parallel, right? I cannot do any uh, sort of uh, parallel processing here. which is why we will need to talk about a three bus design uh, in a few minutes. Now, describing how the data flows. I talked about this uh, briefly uh, earlier as well. We need a notation to describe how data flows from register to bus and to register, right? So for example, if I wanted to say the contents of the program counter, which are an address to the next instruction, I'm going to put them onto the bus, right? That's what I said first. You remember that? PC to bus, bus to MAR, right? So I'm going to write that register transfer using the notation PC arrow to bus. That signifies that the contents of the PC are written on the single bus. Now each of these operations may really be several micro operations. So uh, several micro operations, for example, program counter, if I need to write the contents of program counter onto the bus, then I need to uh, make output enable of this particular register active first, right? So that register transfer involves many uh, uh, micro operations. We are not focusing on all the micro operations at this at the moment. Let's talk about this now. Register transfer operations. So if this is your bus design, single bus design, and the registers that are involved in this are memory address register, program counter, instruction register, accumulator, ALU, memory buffer register. And there is a single bus that facilitates the movement of this data. In that case, in this slide, we have written all possible register transfer operations. For example, contents of PC written to the bus, contents of instruction register written to the bus, contents of the accumulator written to the bus, contents of the memory buffer register written to the bus, the ALU result written to the bus, and so on. Uh, and just to note, the last one is slightly different because it is hardwired. Accumulator to the ALU A input. That is hardwired right there. Uh, 
so this is uh, this is how we would denote register transfer operations. Now we will go through each of these steps, step one through five, and talk about how to fetch, like what are going to be the register transfer uh, sequence in order to complete step one. This is step one, fetching the next instruction. Everything starts with the program counter. So what would you do? You would read from the program counter to the bus. That's step one. Next, you would put the contents of the bus into the MAR. Then tell the memory to read at that particular address. Step three. That is not shown. That is happening outside. right? Then whatever you read will become available in the memory buffer register. So step four is uh, next. Next step is going to be to move the data from MBR to the bus uh, here. What is the next step? Bus to the instruction register. So that completes fetching the next instruction. So as soon as your instruction register has the instruction to be executed, your step one is done. It starts with the program counter and ends with the contents of instruction register being updated for the next instruction. <coughs> Questions here? Now, because it is the single bus design, everything is consistent. Everything has to be consistent, which means the the number of bits in each register and the number of uh, wires in the bus, they all have to be the same because it's a single bus design. The next step is well, the last one is incrementing PC, right? That's your step five. To, for step five, we would essentially uh, just increment program counter by one in order to point to the next instruction to be executed so that the cycle can uh, keep going. So we are going to assume that ALU has a A plus one operation. So if you want to increment the number by one, that particular operation is uh, is present in the ALU and there is a uh, there is an op code for that. There's a specific op code for incrementing by one, for example, but there is no B plus one operation. So we can do A plus one, but we cannot do B plus one. So how do I increment program counter by one? Well, everything starts with PC. I will move the contents from PC to the bus and then, so that's right here, PC to the bus and bus to accumulator. From the accumulator, it goes to the ALU A side and then the, uh, the control unit would provide the ALU with the appropriate operation code to carry out A plus one operation. So the ALU is going to do A plus one the result is going to be ready on the bus now, and then I just need to put it back onto the PC. That is how program counter can get incremented by one. <coughs> Questions here? All right. Now a more realistic data path would be a three bus design. One bus is slow. I cannot use it for any sort of parallelism. So the three bit can, supports, obviously supports more parallelism. So it means it is going to be faster. However, it will be costlier because now you have three buses instead of one bus. 
and those buses we can use in a very uh, strategic manner. So for example, we can have address bus that is only going to talk address or is going to be involved in any communication that has address in it. The result bus can be used only for results, either to, you know, maybe store a result to memory uh, or to reuse a temporary result from the ALU for the next operation. Uh, so I use the result bus only for uh, storing the result to memory or to use it back into the accumulator. So if to, so as to continue an operation. And then the last one over here is the memory bus. So only talk address. So one is an address bus. The other is sorry, memory bus only talks about data being uh, read and written to the uh, memory, right? So the memory bus is where the data is being exchanged. Address bus is specifically used for address. The result bus is uh, for results. So it still c contains the data. So using the, 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 the N and M and C that we used for size of data lines and size for address lines and size of control lines. Can you guys tell me what is the size of address bus? <clears throat> Uh, size as in the number of wires, number of wires in address bus. So you, if, if you go back here, you see we said N bits for data lines, M bits for address lines, C bit for control lines, right? Now we are saying We are using three different buses. So address bus could be many wires, right? So I'm I'm saying how many wires are involved in address bus, result bus, and memory bus. But n so n is uh, data, right? Data and address are different things. So for address, I need to talk address. So address bus would essentially be M. The result bus would be N. The memory bus would also be N. You guys see that? So result bus and memory bus are uh, containing, are moving data are talking data, but address bus is talking address. So it needs to be consistent with the number of address lines that are, we, we, talk, we said it's M, right? Uh, question is, but couldn't you have a single data line with a clock? Huh? No, no, no. So, so the data line is multiple bits, right? So for example, if you're using a 32 bit computer, that means that you have a 32 bit data bus going or a 64 bit data bus going, which is different from the number of address lines. The, the address bus that depends on the size of the address bus actually depends on the, your, the size of your memory. So, you could use a 64-bit computer with a one, one terabyte hard drive, or you could use a 64-bit computer with a 10 megabyte hard drive, right? It, it, it is your choice. So when you change the memory, you change the address bus size. When you change the, the, the number of bits for the computer, you are changing your result bus and the memory bus. Uh, So the main separation over here is the the data versus address. So memory bus talks data, hence n bits. The result bus also talks data. For example, the result of the addition. So n bits, data, still data. 
address bus specifically talks address so that is going to be with respect to the memory right so it's going to be m for that how can we do increment of pc in this case uh, we can so in uh, most uh, designs incrementing of pc is one specific opcode so you can get the pc uh, information and so uh, it is handled by the com uh, control unit in a uh, in a spe special case because it needs to happen every cycle right at the end of every cycle every step 5 involves the pc incrementing by 1 so that's actually hard coded as one specific opcode we will take a look at that example in in just a, just a minute but you're right it is not shown over here as a as a possibility over here what we would have to do is store the address and then bring it back into the 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 memory bus right so one way to do this, uh, one way to increment PC using this design is you tell me the address, right? PC, get that address bus. PC needs to come into MBR. So, uh, sorry, PC needs to come to the ALU B side or ALU A side somehow, right? We, we'll talk more about that special case in just a minute. Uh, a little bit of theory about comparison with Pentium. I'm going to uh, let you guys talk about that. Not not too too uh, critical to our discussion. I want to spend most of the time here on uh, the uh, the flow of step one through five. So I've got 15 le minutes left, which I want to uh, use up for uh, the discussion about how step one through step five is get carried out. So we are going to add memory to this, add memory to the three bus design. You still have the memory bus, you still have the result bus, R bus, or, and then you still have the uh, A bus, address, A bus, memory bus, and then you have the result bus, of course. So there is a ALU, there is memory address register, program counter, instruction register, accumulator, ALU A side, ALU B side, ALU result that can go back into the accumulator, right? So all of that is uh, present over here. And we are also saying that memory is n bits wide with two power m words. What does that mean? That means that there are two raised to m rows in this. And at each row, you have n bits. At each row, n bits, right? Because we have n bits for data and m bits for address. So if you have m bits for address, you can have two raised to m rows in that memory. And at each address, you need to have n bits because n bits is the width of R bus, M bus, Uh, and a bus is the only one with m rows uh, m bits so how does it start everything starts with the program counter right so when uh, when it starts with the program counter you load the contents of the program counter into the mar now once you load the contents into the mar the memory address register is going to interact with the memory, read that particular row. When you read that particular row, you can get the, uh, hold up, uh, memory bus, oh, there it is. So when you read things out of the uh, memory, you can go to the instruction register this way. MBR is not shown here, right? MBR is part of the memory. M bus go to the instruction register that will complete step number one now 
if you if we think back about incrementing PC for that we have this other route which can go back into the instruction register as well and then that can be used to to add the number more about that later but in a in a in a in a straightforward instruction being executed if program counter holds the address of the next instruction it gets loaded into the mar first L and that mar corresponds to a particular row in the memory that needs to be read once it is read it goes to the mbr a register that is not shown explicitly over here but part of the ram from the mbr using the memory bus it will eventually get loaded into the instruction register that completes step number one step number two is to uh, decode the instruction is it decode the instruction I think step number two is to decode the instruction yes so the control unit which is going to be outside of this is going to take a look at the instruction register opcode and figure out what instruction this is and if it needs to bring some uh, operands it will bring those operands from the memory to the ALUB side using that memory bus again but that needs to be facilitated by the control unit once that is done step step two is uh, step three is finished we have fetched the operands step four is to actually execute the instruction so ALU is going to execute the instruction and then the result is going to be available uh, on the result bus uh, but we can we can if we need to store it that is another instruction but that will complete step four step five is simply incrementing pc by one so the, where is the control unit it is the finite state machine that that is shown over here so the inputs to the finite state machine in the opcode uh, uh, decoding of the instruction step is the opcode those are the three bits that are shown over here right those are essentially present at the most significant locations of the instruction register but other parts of the instruction register include the address of the operand the finite state machine or the control unit looks at the opcode and then provides the control signals to the ALU to carry out that particular operation the finite state machine also uh, has to uh, control the load and output uh, enable uh, controls for all the other registers as well some of them are shown here now what I, I, I what I really want to get to is this particular instruction let us suppose that you want we want to execute accumulator equals accumulator plus some address so you, you see what you have, what you are doing here we are taking the contents of the accumulator and we want to add some uh, number present at a memory location so you provide me the address I will look it up in the memory and add that particular number to this current uh, contents of the accumulator and then I will place the result of that addition back into the accumulator so accumulator equals accumulator plus some uh, address N not plus address I should say plus the number at that address plus the contents at that address so how are we going to do that I'm going to talk about the five steps that are involved in this the first one is instruction fetch everything starts with the program counter program counter the address gets loaded into the MAR move PC to MAR that's step one so that gets carried out here so let me highlight them as we go move PC to MAR that's from here to here who who controls that the finite state machine the control unit will facilitate that by making the output enable and the load inputs of these registers active in order to move that register to register content you remember earlier we talked about how to move contents from register 1 to register 3 similar thing needs to happen over here with respect to PC to MAR next once the instruction is here we need to 
initiate the memory read sequence, which means the finite state machine needs to uh, inform the memory system that I want to read at that memory location. So that's step number two. Uh, that's the second step in the instruction fetch step. Next, once you read the data that you just read at the location present at in, in the program counter needs to move to the instruction register. How does it move? It moves through here. That's the instruction path. So step one completes mean instruction register has the instruction to be executed. Step two is instruction decode, which means take a look at the opcode bits. The opcode bits are present in the instruction register. The instruction register is usually formatted as two separate fields. The first field, the most significant field is the opcode. And then the, there is an operand specifier it, at the, as the second field. So this is operation code. And this is the address of operand. In this case, this is going to be this. So clearly, if this is, how many bits is this? How many bits is that? It's an address. So it has to be how many bits? M is right. This has to be M bits because it's an address and we can only accept addresses that are M bits long. So who dictates how many opcodes are there? Well, you can have this field to be an arbitrary field, right? It could depend on. Uh, it could depend on the number of operations that you need to carry out. But remember, the instruction register itself. Where is that being stored? Instruction register is contains two fields, but it is coming from the memory. So what is the total size of the instruction register? Remember, each location is n bits, right? So how much, how, so what is this going to be? If the total length is capital N and we have capital M for the address of the operand, how many bits are there for the opcode? The total is capital N, right? That's capital N. Because that needs to be stored in the memory. But because this is total is N, operand specifier is an address. So N, yes, N minus N. Right. So that is going to dictate how many operations you can actually do. How many operations can you do now? Number of operations equals two raised to n minus m, right? All right, let's continue here. In, in the instruction decode, uh, step, the control unit looks at the n minus m bits of the opcode and then sends out the uh, operation code uh, sequence to the ALU to carry out that particular operation. In this case, it is the addition operation, right? But it also needs to uh, look up the operand. It needs to fetch the operand. 
at that particular address. So that's going to be step three. Step three is going to be move the operand address from the instruction register to the MAR. And where is that happening? I'm just going to highlight that in pink here. Uh, too big. That is this. Because I need to bring that, bring the memory address, this guy, to the, uh, to this, to B, right? I need to load it to B side so that I can add. So initiate a memory read sequence so that I can read that. Once you re read that, what do you have? You have the accumulator information hardwired to ALU A side. You have the uh, loaded memory, uh, loaded operand on the B side. So those two are ready to instruction, uh, to do the execution of the instruction. The control unit already decoded the, the instruction and provided the specific operation code to the ALU. The ALU carries out the addition operation and now the result is available at this point S, right? Because we are going to need, we are, this S is hardwired back into the accumulator. So it, it writes to the accumulator. That completes step four. Housekeeping is going to be simply to update program counter so that it can point to the next instruction. So let us, uh, what is IR to PC bus used for? Where is that? Oh, uh, it is used for uh, a branching instruction. You're, you're talking about this, right? So suppose you want to branch. If you want to branch, well, what does that mean? Uh, I want to stop executing the instructions uh, in a particular sequence. I want to start executing the instructions at a different location. So that's a part of the branch instruction. Uh, something like in, in, in uh, some programming languages, you may have go to, right? Like go to a particular line in the code. It, it's like that, but it's an address. So we'll talk about the branch instruction uh, when we meet again, but that's what it is part of. All right, I'm going to stop recording here.